Hey y'all, welcome to Tryon Palace Live. I am Lindy Cummings and today we're going to take a look at the 1781 British raid on New Bern. Uh, if you've got any questions, you can write them in the comments and I'll try to answer a few at the end of my presentation. And hopefully there won't be too much background noise, but I do have the city doing some work on the street outside my window. And of course I am live streaming from home and I have dogs and kids, so you may hear some background noise. I apologize for that. All right, let's go ahead and get started here. All right. So a quick note on some of the terms that you will hear today. Um, you're going to hear me refer to North Carolina residents and revolutionaries alternately as Whigs, Rebels, and Patriots. Whig was a contemporary political party, political designation, as opposed to Tories, uh, who were supporters of the king. Whigs uh, in, in, the, in the colonies were typically supporters of independence. Rebels were how the British referred to the colonial supporters of the revolution. And patriots, of course, is often how we refer today to supporters of the revolution. <clears throat> it was the evening of August 19th, 1781 in New Bern, North Carolina. And if the Augusts of 239 years ago were like the Augusts of today, it was probably hot and humid with the incessant buzzing of insects filling the air. It was a Sunday and perhaps the residents of the small port city had retired to their porches and piazzas after Sunday dinner, longing for a cool river breeze to come over the Trent or the Noose. Whatever it was, hot or muggy or what uh, breezeless, it was undoubtedly a tense evening. Rumors of a British raid had been swirling around the city for weeks, and not just the city, but the entire countryside. Even though General Lord Cornwallis and the bulk of the British Army had turned their backs on the Carolinas in favor of subjugating Virginia, a choice that would ultimately end at Yorktown, the British maintained a presence at Wilmington with the 82nd Regiment of Foot under the command of Major James Henry Craig. And a few weeks prior to this August evening, a lieutenant of the 82nd had been captured and confessed that Craig and the regiment would soon be converging on New Bern. And by the middle of August, dispatch writers were carrying news across the colony that indeed Craig was on the move. Uh, the image that you see here is a 1767 map, or sorry, 1769 map of New Bern. Uh, which features the palace. Uh, this one is courtesy of the Clements Library, and I greatly appreciate their willingness to share this image with us. Craig's march acted like a wedge in an area that um, Patriot leader and militia commander William Caswell described as a very disaffected part of the country. It revealed those who harbored quiet support for the king and it endangered those who had been more vocal in their support of the revolution and vice versa. Craig left in his wake a few burn plantations and the plundered and smoldering wharves on New Bern's waterfront, but it was really the divisions in the community that Craig's raid revealed that gives us a glimpse of the nature of the revolution in the colony of North Carolina. And today we tend to think about these, uh, about the divisions of the revolution is being very neat. Uh, it's us versus them. It's loyalists versus patriots. But really what the raid reveals is this messier, more convoluted struggle um, that really reminds one more of civil war than anything else. And so today we're going to look at two causes that uh, kind of underlie the British raid on New Bern. Uh, primarily, you know, what caused the disaffection? Uh, why were state leaders considering this part of the country to be disaffected? And secondly, what were the strategic results of the foray to New Bern? Um, was there a strategy? Um, because the raid yielded no obvious strategic results. So in order to kind of understand the disaffection which Caswell was referring to, we really have to go back to the 1760s. 
And to briefly recap the economic situation uh, in the 1760s, North Carolina was an extremely cash poor colony. There was little hard currency circulating and even less circulating among backcountry residents. So a merchant in New Bern is struggling to get any hard currency. They're struggling to really operate uh, on a cash basis. They're relying on credit primarily. Uh, but this is doubly true for residents of the backcountry. Uh, but taxes had to be paid in hard currency. In addition to being cash poor, backcountry residents were plagued with dishonest officials. Uh, extortion was a routine practice. There were poorly kept official records that really helped facilitate extortive practices. And in some cases, backcountry residents grew so upset with officials that they instigated riots or assaulted officials. There is one story about the death of a minor official whose grave was actually unearthed by enraged residents because they really thought that he uh, was fabricating his own death in order to protect himself from reprisals. And he actually was dead, so they were very ashamed when they unearthed his body. The great chronicler of North Carolina history, William Powell, wrote that the people had serious grounds for complaint and a government response to popular sentiment would have speedily remedied matters, um, but that really wasn't to be the case. So the regulators were looking to coastal elites um, and seeing them as turning a blind eye to the abuses of officials tasked with collecting the uh, province's taxes. Governor Tryon, who was a uh, governor from uh, half the 1760s, he was very sympathetic to their plight and he attempted to introduce some bills to the assembly hoping to regulate bookkeeping, curb extortion, promote honesty amongst officials. And the assembly also attempted to take up some reforms. But the problem, one of the problems was that the regulators were running up against these larger concerns, like the growing dispute between the American colonies and parliament over taxation. So the same elites who would join with Tryon against the regulators were the very men who were conversely setting up committees and passing resolutions condemning Parliament's actions against the colonies. So when it came time for those same leaders to uh, call on support from residents of the colony, they were rightly anxious about whether that support would be forthcoming. There were other disaffected groups in the colony, um, well, primarily backcountry residents. Highland Scottish settlers, um, they'd experienced the uh, kind of um, uh, apocalyptic defeat at Culloden uh, in the 1740s. And as a part of that, they had sworn an oath to the British monarchy. So they were less likely to side with revolutionary leaders. Uh, of course, this story has gotten a lot of attention in recent years with the popularity of Diana Gabaldon's Outlander series. Uh, Scottish settlers did participate in one engagement that was at Morris Creek. Um, but they were soundly defeated by North Carolina Continentals and militia. And there was a second group. And this second group were those who simply remained loyal to Great Britain. They saw themselves as British citizens first and foremost. They saw Britain as their home country, uh, even though they were uh, lifelong colonial residents. Uh, these group, this group was described by the historian Leonard Lebery as men whose innate conservatism, devotion to Great Britain and the monarchy or personal self-interest led them to side with the mother country. So merchants and clergy, primarily Anglican clergy, were two groups that were most likely to remain loyal to the crown. So in order to place the British raid on Newburgh in the larger scope of the American Revolution, let's take a quick tour of that conflict leading up to the raid in 1781. So as I just mentioned, the regulators ran up against the larger colonial response to what they perceived as unjust taxes levied on them by parliament in the forms of duties on imported goods, official stamps on imported paper, restrictions on settlements in Western territories occupied by native groups, etc. All of this was unfolding in the decade following the end of the Seven Years' War or the French and Indian War as we better know it. Um, this was after Parliament determined that the colonies ought to assist the British government in paying for a war that was fought on their behalf. North Carolina hosted its first Provincial Congress in July of 1774, and the first Continental Congress met in Philadelphia in September of 1774. Uh, that's one of the reasons why our license plates say First in Liberty, uh, because, um, or First in Freedom 
because uh, North Carolina hosted a provincial Congress before there was an actual Continental Congress. Uh, in April of 1775, British Army regulars stationed in Boston under General Thomas Gage clashed with Massachusetts militiamen at Lexington and Concord, and we often refer to that as the shot heard around the world. In 1776, the first North Carolina Continentals and the Newburn and Wilmington District militias defeated a group of Scottish loyalists at Moores Creek. And then from 76 to 78, although North Carolina Continental troops are seeing action with George Washington, in the mid-Atlantic colonies, North Carolina and the Southern colonies in general saw no real action. Uh, and that really all changed in 1779 when Georgia fell to the British and in December, Sir Henry Clinton laid siege to Charleston, South Carolina. North Carolina scrambled its militia groups and mounted a stout resistance. There were several significant battles, uh, Camden, Kings Mountain, Guilford Courthouse, and after a dearly bought victory at Guilford Courthouse, Cornwallis retreated to Wilmington. And from there, he considered his best options and decided to begin a slow journey towards Virginia and a final fateful encounter at Yorktown. And of course that left Wilmington in the hands of Major James Craig and the 82nd Regiment of Foot. Well, who, uh, who were the uh, 82nd Regiment of Foot that occupied Wilmington? Um, the 82nd was a Scottish regiment. It was sponsored by the Duke of Hamilton and commanded in the beginning by Colonel Francis McLean. They were raised in 1778 and then they were deployed following a year's training. So they deployed in 1779. Half of the regiment went to Penobscot, Maine where they defended Fort George against an American naval assault commanded by Paul Revere. And yes, it is that Paul Revere, silversmith and midnight rider. The other half of the regiment consisting of a company of grenadiers and light infantry were sent to New York. The ship that was carrying them, however, ran aground near New Jersey and most of the unit was drowned, save a handful of officers and about two dozen enlisted men. The officers were paroled because that was the custom, but the enlisted men remained prisoner in Philadelphia. The regiment was then regrouped under the command of Major James Henry Craig, and they joined the Naval Expedition uh, to Wilmington. Craig's assignment was to hold the city and Fort Johnston at the mouth of the Cape Fear River, and then prepare to assist Cornwallis by sending supplies and support to Cross Creek, which is now Fayetteville. Craig failed to adequately secure Cross Creek. Uh, this severely hampered Cornwallis's expedition against the Continental troops. Um, of course, uh, the, the war in the Carolinas was uh, very much kind of a guerrilla war, which is one of the reasons why the British really couldn't get the upper hand. They were kind of constantly fighting uh, these pop-up uh, battles and their supply lines were exceptionally vulnerable, which was why Cross Creek was so strategic. Uh, Craig had been directed to evacuate Wilmington in May of 1781, but he actually disregarded those orders and chose to remain uh, in order to support loyalists. The Whig government or the colonial government under Thomas Burke realized that a stable government, a stable Whig government, a patriot government would win the support of the people better than anything else. They were weary from war. Um, that stability is really was really hard to maintain because militia troops, as much as they were uh, adored by the assembly, they were very ineffective in North Carolina and they were no match for British regulars. Craig's strategy, on the other hand, was to destabilize that government and leave no room for neutrality. So in order to affect that, he laid down an ultimatum to the public. Swear allegiance by August 1st or face the consequences. So as that August deadline loomed, tensions were rising, of course. On July 31st, William Caswell, militia commander, reported to Governor Thomas Burke that a lieutenant had been captured. He was a uh, lieutenant of the 82nd Regiment, 
And he was carrying a letter from Cornwallis in Virginia to Craig. And the lieutenant confessed that he was supposed to meet Craig at New Bern because Craig was shortly going to march that way. On August 1st, Craig left Wilmington with 250 regulars and 80 loyalists, and he began cutting a swath through the North Carolina countryside, pillaging and raiding rebel plantations, removing enslaved people from their masters, and enforcing his oath of loyalty. Burke, knowing the weakness of the troops under him and the shortages of supplies, commanded all the militias to carefully watch and harass Craig's troops, but not to engage in any sort of direct engagement. He knew that the militia were no match for the disciplined regulars, and he didn't want to waste those critical supplies. Uh, there were militia, however, who disregarded Burke's orders, and they were soundly routed. So as Craig drew near to Newburn towards the middle of the month, the citizens uh, began a mad scramble to prepare. One local, John Banks, wrote his brother that he had packed his papers and prepared to leave town. Leading New Bern rebels, John Green and Titus Ogden went into hiding. And at the palace, a group of men hurried to remove all of the lead from the palace where it could be spared without hurting the building. The North Carolina militia were in such dire need of lead that some proposed removing all of the lead from the building. But in order to protect the structure, they ended up leaving some of it in place. This thwarted the British from easily carrying off what lead was um, uh, easily mean, uh, obtained. So like gutters, downspouts, things like that were all done of lead. The image that you see here is uh, one of the uh, surviving 18th century images of the palace. It's on a $5 note um, from the 1770s. And um, this particular one is in our collection. And you can see it you know, bears a remarkable resemblance to the building that was reconstructed in the 1950s. So on August 19th, Caswell reported to Burke that the British were on the verge of occupying New Bern. And on August 20th, the British regulars, some 400 loyalists, so Craig had been very successful in enforcing his oath because he'd gone from 80 to 400 some. Uh, and Major Craig, they all marched into New Bern. They concentrated their efforts where it would hurt the town the most. So Craig and his forces burned ships, docked at the wharves, destroyed rigging, and about 3,000 bushels of salt. During the brief occupation, there was only one casualty, and that was a local physician, Dr. Alexander Gaston. Gaston was a particularly ardent patriot, and he had earned the enmity of uh, leading loyalists in the region. And uh, he was in New Bern at the time that Craig's uh, group arrived, and he attempted to flee in a ferry boat across the river. An angry loyalist took aim with a rifle and killed Dr. Gaston. And uh, his son was Judge William Gaston, uh, leading jurist in North Carolina, uh, leading uh, Catholic uh, in the state when Catholicism was not widespread. Uh, but th this was the only victim of the raid. And so in general, while the damage to the town was minimal, the greatest risk was to the Patriot cause William Caswell, as this raid was unfolding and the occupation was unfolding, he lamented to Governor Burke that the British had, quote, come through a very disaffected part of the country and most of the inhabitants have joined them. Of course, remember those 400 Tories who've gone from eight to 400. I am fearful, Caswell wrote, uh, that without assistance from continental troops, that this part of the country will be entirely lost. So he really sees Craig's raid as swaying the populace back to the monarchy. And for a few months, uh, it did indeed, indeed seem that Craig had achieved the kind of instability that he uh, had set out to achieve and that Caswell feared uh, would sway the king back, uh, sway the people back to the king's fold. In the aftermath of the raid on Newbern, uh, Patriots carried out reprisals against those who had been confronted by Craig and had sworn oil loyalty to the crown. 
Whether sincerely or out of expediency, who knew? In the same way that neutrality had not been an option with Craig and the British, it was now not an option with Patriot supporters. And then, of course, in conversely, loyalist readers would terrorize in return. So it's kind of this back and forth. You might join one side in, in word uh, to escape having your home pillaged or burned, and then the other side comes along to basically attack you for having sworn your oath of allegiance or you know voiced your support, and they're going to do the same thing. So if you're a person trying to maintain some sort of middle ground, that's really impossible. The most stunning turn of events, though, was a few weeks after Craig's raid, uh, between 600 and 700 loyalists, that's a lot of people, uh, under the notorious David Fanning, uh, they very boldly rolled into Hillsborough in September, and they seized the Patriot governor, Thomas Burke, and another 200 prisoners. They looted the town, and then they all retreated to Wilmington. A group of Patriot militia pursued Fanning's group. Um, they were trying to secure the governor and the other prisoners. But as they neared Wilmington, a group of British regulars were sent out by Craig. And the militia had to turn back because they just were uh, no match for the disciplined British regulars. There were 20 uh, men killed in that encounter and 25 additional held prisoner. So while Craig and his loyalist supporters expected this to be a crushing blow to the rebel cause, and you can imagine if you've basically ridden into their capital, taken their governor and 200 other people, that it really would destabilize the Patriot government. It actually worked in reverse. It strengthened the Patriot resolve. Uh, intent on driving Craig from Wilmington, the Patriot leaders gathered a significant force and prepared to attack the city. In a final act of retribution, Craig expelled the wives and children of rebel sympathizers from Wilmington. However, it was now October and besieged at Yorktown, General Lord Cornwallis surrendered to George Washington on the 19th of that month. It would take another month. This just shows you how slow news traveled in the day. It took another month for the news of Cornwallis' surrender to reach Craig at Wilmington. And at that point, he realized that his situation was quite precarious. So he hurriedly assembled transport ships for his own troops and um, loyalist sympathizers gathered up as much as they could carry and joined that transport. And they sailed to Charleston. After going to Charleston, they sailed to New York and finally ended up in Halifax, Canada, uh, where the regiment was eventually disbanded and the men of the unit who wanted land were granted land. So really, in the grand scheme of things, the raid on New Bern in and of itself was largely insignificant. It, there was no long-standing occupation. Um, there wasn't any strategic point in holding the city. But as part of the larger colonial conflict, it represented an important example of how conflicted locals were and how the war affected communities even when they weren't directly occupied by British troops. If you're interested in learning more about the life of a British soldier, which we don't often really uh, explore, I recommend Don Haggis' book, British Soldiers, American War. Uh, it, um, he also publishes a blog, Mr. Haggis publishes a blog, redcoat76.blogspot.com, and it details stories about British forces. And there's several stories about the 82nd Regiment that's included on that blog. If you are familiar with NCpedia, William Gaston's entry includes a longer description of the murder of his father, Alexander Gaston, which is interesting. And finally, to understand more about the uh, kind of Civil War nature of the war in North Carolina, I recommend Wayne Lee's Crowds and Soldiers in Revolutionary North Carolina. It's a fascinating read uh, and really kind of um, not and not just for the revolution but prior to the revolution the regulator rebellion as well um discusses uh, some of the um conflict in in a, in a kind of a different way so i want to thank everyone uh, for joining me and if there are any questions i'm out of powerpoint and pull back up chrome and see if anyone has any questions 
All right, let's see here. Doesn't really seem to be any questions. Well then, I'll remind you that our next broadcast is going to be on Thursday, and that's going to take place in our conservation lab. So you'll want to make sure you follow our Facebook and our website um, for our uh, most current Tryon Palace live schedule. Uh, if you think of any questions in the meantime, I'm always happy to answer them. You can get in touch with me by email. Of course, I'm teleworking, so I'm a little slower in responding but um, I'm happy to answer any research questions that you might have. My uh, email is lindy.cummings at ncdcr. I'm the research historian, and I hope you will all have a great week and be well.